Chapter 177 Sudden Turn of Events Audrey stopped writing after she finished sharing some interesting news and scandals about aristocrats. She then adopted a serious pose as she recalled something. With her exceptional memory as a spectator, she arranged the information that she had received from her father's teachings, as well as the news she heard during banquets and salons into paragraphs. After creating a draft in her head, Audrey penned. As, As for, for the political, political situation, situation in Backland you asked about, it's, it's not, not within, within my area of interest. interest. I can, I can describe, describe it to you only based, based on my own impressions, impressions and the details, details that I happen to know. Some, Some time, time ago, Father, Father told, told me that after, after the abolishment of the Grain Act, Act the prices, prices of crops, crops were declining rapidly. rapidly. The, the rent, rent of farmland and pastures, pastures were also plunging, plunging. but I don't know the exact magnitude. I can only explain it to you with this example. As you know, Duke Negan is an aristocrat who owns the most land outside of the royal family. It's said that he owns more than 12 million pounds worth of farmland, pastures, and forests. Last year, his land earned him a historic 1,300,000 pounds in rent. But this year, it's forecast that his rent will only be 850,000 pounds, a whole 450,000 pounds less. That's more than the entirety of the assets I'm entitled to. Without any further explanation for me, I'm sure that my dear brother will understand the behavior of most old-fashioned nobles. They're proud of being landowners, and their income is derived mostly from rent. They place a heavy emphasis on their appearance and would maintain their current lifestyle, even if they have to go into debt. They spend tens of thousands of pounds on the upkeep of their castles each year, many more thousands on clothes and jewelry, as well as their persistent hunting activities social banquets, and the occasional lavish weddings and funerals, etc., etc. With the decrease in rent, according to my knowledge, a good portion of the nobles have met with financial difficulties. Because of this, Earl Wolf has sold 84,000 heirs of land in the countryside and gotten 29,000 pounds in return. Viscount Conrad has also sold his art collection worth 55,000 pounds to a national art gallery. Other than a few visionary nobles who had long shifted their focus to steel, coal, railroads, banks, and rubber industries, the rest of the nobles have been severely affected by the Grain Act. Let us praise our dear Earl Hall. Father told me that the financial distress will loosen the control the nobles have over politics. As you can imagine, the number of ministers with blue blood will decline from the next year onward. In a bid to secure funding, the Conservative Party and the New Party have promised to confer upon anyone the noble titles as long as they donate a sufficient amount of money and lack any criminal records. Of course, the caveat is that the person who donated the money must own an amount of land befitting of a noble. One example is the rich Mr. Sindris. He purchased the lowest area of land expected of a baron, 60,000 heirs, then donated 100,000 pounds to the Carlton Club, and £400,000 to the Conservative Party, and donations to charity amounting to £300,000. Finally, he succeeded in receiving conferment from His Majesty and became a highly regarded baron. I've heard that there's a price list to this. £300,000 for a baronet, and £700,000 to £1 million for a hereditary baron. There is no clear price for the title of Viscount or Count, but I'm sure those are sufficiently ridiculous. This year, Many nobles who are facing financial difficulties are starting to seriously consider the possibility of marriages with wealthy merchants. There have already been three marriages like this over the last two months. The betrothal gifts the noble women received are something to be envied. Also, the workers who protested the Grain Act did experience a decrease in the cost of living, but the quality of their lives has not improved. Instead, it seems to have deteriorated as the bankrupt farmers have entered the city and stolen their jobs by requesting lower wages. Thus, the wages of the laborers are dropping rapidly. I remember the day when Father asked me who I felt was the winner of the Grain Act. My dear Alfred, you must know the answer. You would definitely be able to obtain a hereditary baron title through your own efforts. Shio Derecha and Forrest Wall were returning to the Backland Bridge borough after they received Audrey's reply. Shio, with her messy blonde hair, was looking out the window of the carriage. Her eyes were bright like two burning balls of flame. 
She muttered the term 450 pounds to herself repeatedly, as if reciting an incantation. Her strength and courage grew every time she repeated the term. Darkholm hasn't reported the status of the investigation today. Let's make a trip to his house. Shio suddenly turned to look at Force. Darkholm was the leader of a gang in the Backland East Borough and had control over many beggars and thieves. Even though he looked very friendly with his chubby face that was perpetually adorned with a warm and amiable smile, Shio knew that he was a merciless scoundrel. He once broke the arm of a 13-year-old thief because the boy had hidden his profit. Unless it was necessary, Shio was unwilling to meet Darkholm, but Darkholm was one of the few people who were most familiar with the vagrants in the city. Forrest pushed her slightly curly hair back behind her ear. As long as it doesn't delay my lunch. No problem. Perhaps I could treat you to an Intus feast after this week. Shio promised in complacency. Must I thank God? <laughs> Forrest asked as she laughed. Unlike Shio, Forrest was a moderate believer of the god of steam and machinery. As they conversed, the two ladies switched to another public carriage and arrived at the Backland East Borough and arrived at Dark Holmes' house. It was a terrace house located in a narrow alley. There were green plants hanging from the walls. The exterior looked relatively unkempt. Shio walked to the door raised her right hand and knocked in a unique rhythm. The unlocked door opened with a creak following her knocks. Shio's apparently confused expression immediately turned stern, like a wary lion's. She took out a triangular blade she carried with her and cautiously pushed open the door. She then slowly stepped inside. Boris also stopped looking nonchalant, having produced a dagger of unknown origins. They didn't smell any peculiar scents but their rich experience told them that something was off. One step, two steps, three steps. Shio and Forrest entered Darkholm's house. Then, they saw a pale limb on a gas lamp, internal organs on a coffee table, as well as strips upon strips of flesh strewn on the floor and hung on the clothes rack. Pieces of bone had been stripped clean and piled up near the door, and amongst the bones was a head, its vacant eyes open. It was none other than Darkholm. His chubby face still maintained the amiable smile, as if everything was normal. Furthermore, there was no stench of blood in the house. As a former clinical doctor before becoming a best-selling author and sequence line beyond her, Forrest had seen many death scenes more disgusting than this. She patted the tense Shio, who was on the brink of vomiting, as she surveyed the surroundings. Kilongos? Vice Admiral Hurricane Kilongos. He realized that Darkholm was investigating the missing vagrants and tracked him back to his house. Or could it be said that Darkholm had tracked him down, but ended up being caught? Shio fought back the urge to wretch and said with a serious expression, He sure lives up to his name as a merciless and crafty pirate admiral. The strangeness here also fits the description of his treasure. Crafty? Boris was suddenly alarmed as she blurted out. Could he be waiting nearby in an ambush against the mastermind behind the investigations? Shio froze for a moment before answering in a fluster. That's highly likely. He was a Sequence 6 Wind Blessed, a powerful pirate with a mystical artifact, while they were just two Sequence 9s. This was an extremely simple and easy contrast. In the house opposite Dark Holmes' house, a man with a unique broad chin and dark green eyes in his thirties was standing by the window coldly observing Shio's and Forrest's opening of the door and slow entry. He was none other than Vice Admiral Hurricane Kilongos. The black glove on his left hand twitched as if it were alive. A layer of dull gold scales appeared on its surface. Kilongos revealed a cruel and joyous expression as his dark green eyes turned pale gold and indifferent. The moment Forrest realized this, she dragged Shio to the other side and avoided the area just across the main door. She then gritted her pearly white teeth and took out a bracelet that was hidden by her sleeves. This silver bracelet had three dark green, coarse stones which showed signs of burn marks and were rough and uneven. Forrest pulled out one of the stones and let out a low growl on ancient Hermes. Door! She grabbed onto Chio Dericha tightly as the stone released a faint blue glow. The figures of the two ladies turned indistinct, nearly invisible. They saw many forms they found difficult to describe. There were even transparent objects that didn't seem to exist. They saw different colors, 
lustrous splendors which seemed to possess immense knowledge, they had entered the mysterious spirit world. In this strange world that stood distinct from reality, Boris proceeded in a particular direction while pulling Shio along. Seconds later, they exited their indistinct states and returned to reality, to Backland. But they were no longer at Dark Home's house, but instead arrived at an empty cemetery. Kilongos, who was wearing his scaled glove, silently appeared at the door of Dark Home's house. He swept the interior with his cold gaze. He froze for a moment, then creased his brows as he muttered to himself, Traveler. In the cemetery. What are we going to do next? Forrest panted, sensing the predicament and feeling a lingering sense of fear. The bracelet was a mystical item she had received, along with the formula for Apprentice and its corresponding materials back during a fortuitous encounter of hers. Other than causing her to hear strange, faint murmurings during the full moon every month, it posed no threat. There were originally five stones on the bracelet. Each stone allowed her to traverse through the spirit world, technically allowing her to teleport. But now, there were only two stones left. Sheol calmed herself down and nodded solemnly. First notify Miss Audrey. Then, then we call the police.